to markets. However, in the short story world, a lot of the information um, also works really well if you're an indie writer. So, you know, they talk about traditional uh, stuff and, and you're interested in that, take some notes on that. If it's just the content stuff, take the notes on that. Basically take whatever notes you need. And of course, we'll have time for uh, questions as this goes along. If you have a question early on that, uh, you know, kind of fits the topic I'm, I'm talking, you can always wave your hand for a, uh, a mic and they'll bring it over to you or you can go over to the mic stand, which I see sitting right there. Uh, if not, we'll just have questions at the end of it. <clears throat> so a little, little backstory on me for those who don't know who I am. I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm a New York Times bestselling novelist of over 40 novels. Uh, I'm the editor of 18 anthologies of various kinds, various genres. I also have 13 short collections of my own out there. Um, and I edit Weird Tales magazine, which is the relaunch of the world's oldest horror magazine. And um, we're just about to ramp up to a, a bigger production schedule, which means I'll be buying more stories for that magazine. And um, I also do a lot of other projects. I, I, I like working with short fiction in a lot of different ways because it offers so many creative opportunities, not just for personal growth as a writer, but, you know, for making money as a writer. And I love to see writers make money and get paid. Big fan of that. No matter how that happens, I like to see it happen. So a little, little backstory on, on um, how I got involved in short stories, because you know, I grew up like most, most professional readers, and that's pretty much what we all are, readers first. I, I read a lot of short stories growing up. I used to love when they would do the scholastic book fairs and come around with the boxes of different things you, or the lists of things you can order. And I would always order the short story collections. Uh, uh, everything from uh, Sherlock Holmes to those creepy short collections of old M.R. James and Andrew Spears things and, and so on. Uh, when I became a novelist, though, I didn't really have any interest or, or even thoughts about writing short stories. I had started writing novels in my 40s. My first one was published when I was 48. And um, novels were kind of my zone. But one of the things that happens when you have works out there is you start getting on the radar of editors who are looking for people to contribute. And I went up being invited to two anthologies in the same week, um, both small press, both interesting. One was called History is Dead. And it's all zombie stories set in different historical eras. The other one was um, a book called Legends of the Mountain State, which is all West Virginia um, stories or stories based on the folklore or inspired by the folklore of West Virginia. And um, I didn't really want to do either because I, I, the thing was, I was kind of intimidated by the form of short fiction because when you're a novelist and you identify as a novelist, you think in big, complex stories. I mean, my first novel was 148,000 words. So that's a lot of words and it's not a short story. Um, so when they asked me to, to uh, you know, to contribute, to, to submit, I had to kind of school myself in how to think in short story uh, terms. First, I went back and just reread all of my favorite short stories. This is something I do no matter what form I'm going into, whether it's novels, comics, you know, scripts. I always go back and look at my favorite things that, that, that I'd read in those, in those zones because I wanted to, to remind myself what it is about them I liked. And I always read them once as a reader and then again as a writer. Now, sometimes I read, I, when I read them as a reader, I listen to them on audio. Um, that way I can hear the story and just kind of get into it. But when I sit down to reread them again as a writer, um, I get the print version <clears throat> and I sit there and I, I go through and I look for essentially the carpentry of how it's built. I look for all the elements of style, pace and voice, tone, figurative and descriptive language, um, the, the, the amount of characters in a story, because, you know, I love ensemble casts. So my novels are filled with a lot of characters. Short stories don't really support, they don't have the length to support a lot of characters. So I, you know, I'm thinking, all right, how do you strip down an idea? How do you tell a story with fewer people? Um, these, you know, you would think that that is kind of self-obvious, but it's not. Um, there are there are techniques for everything in the short fiction world. Um, so I, I read and read and read, and then I started coming up with ideas for short stories. I had this one I really liked. Another, another, since I already, um, 
you know, I've been in martial arts my whole life. I, I do Kenjutsu and Jujutsu. Kenjutsu is Japanese swordplay. So I want to do a samurai story set in ancient Japan, but dealing with monsters. You know, uh, I'm a zombie guy, so zombies. Started writing it, and, uh, you know, I have 7,500 uh, word max limit. That was a hard ceiling. And I'm writing and writing, and I look at the word count on word, and I'm 12,000 words in. It's like, oh, crap. So I try to strip it down and, uh, and, and revise it. And I was 9,800 9, words in. I'm like, I couldn't find figure a way to turn that into a short story. So eventually I had to abandon it because, you know, I was burning off my time. So then I decided to try, <laughs> try something uh, based on a bit of advice I had gotten from uh, William F. Nolan, one of the great science fiction writers just passed recently. He wrote uh, Logan's Run, among other things, and great short stories. And uh, he, one of the things he said is, when you try to write a short story and you don't have a real good in, into, you know, doorway into it, write something completely outside of your zone. Uh, because his, his logic was, if you're writing completely outside of your zone, you're less likely to have a lot of the self-indulgent scenes and extra characters that are part of your comfort zone. So you tend to get to the leaner part of the story more quickly. And it was great advice. I, you know, I had, I had never considered writing something funny, you know, and um, certainly never had written a historical piece before. So I started browsing through history, history found the, the, the great uh, fire of Chicago and some interesting tidbits about it. Like the fact that the cow kicking over lantern had nothing to do with the fire start. That, that's, that's a myth. It was actually weirdly, and this is why research is so fun. Bialy's comet was going, you know, through our, uh, our, our, our system at this point. It broke up and a piece, some pieces of it fell. And they think that's what started the Great Fire, because it was also the end of a huge drought that was going on in that area. So it was actually started by a comet thinking, well, that's a great doorway into a zombie story, because what was on that piece of fragment that, that fell? You know, that's how a story starts. So I, I sat down and wrote a comedy story about two idiot moonshiners, you know, involved in gangsters and, and uh, family issues and so on. And then dealing with zombies right at the, you know, that lead up to the great fire of Chicago. And it wound up coming in just about perfect on word count because it was lean. I, you know, I didn't know enough of the history to, you know, to, to be tempted to doing a lot of extra world building that the short story format wouldn't support. You have to pick up when it comes to what content goes in your stories. So I wound up writing the story, Peg, Leg, and Patty Save the World. Um, it, it, the editor bought it. It was um, praised in a lot of the, uh, the reviews, and it wound up being my most frequently reprinted story, uh, 26 times now. It's been, it's been sold to different markets around the world. Um, and only three of those times, I actually offered it as a reprint. It just kept, you know, the, it keeps getting... Uh, requests. It, it kind of kicked me into this, this, this uh, whole mindset of short stories should be the place where I have fun, always a big thing for me, and also where I take risks. And some of my, my most successful in writing have come because of risk-taking, especially in short stories. Now, by the way, the video over there keeps freezing. I don't know if my video feed is freezing. So I don't know if you guys are losing some of what I'm saying. Um, it, are you guys missing some of what I'm saying? No? Oh, good. So I'm not freezing. Okay, cool. Wow. Um, I guess that means you're all... Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Um, what uh, I, we didn't catch or I didn't catch, uh, I know a little bit about the Chicago Fire also. What, what started it? Uh, we... Fragments from Bialy's comment. You just you just froze again. <laughs> Fragments from Bialy's comment. Oh yeah, right. that, that was breaking up over that area while there was a drought. Okay, so the second short story I had to write, and and the reason I'm going into these because each one is an is a different way of kind of unlocking the potential of what you need to write. The second one, um, all folklore short stories set in West Virginia. But the problem is, you know, the editor assigned each writer the, the bit of folklore they wanted us to use. And at the same time, you have to realize that if it's folklore from that area, everyone already knows the folklore. You know, the readers of a book on folklore are like 
likely to already know something about it. And they gave me a bit of folklore that's the most popular bit of folklore from West Virginia, uh, the, the Greenbrier Ghost. Everyone there, there knows that story. <clears throat> so I had to find a way to make the story more interesting. It, was set, it, it took place, this bit of folklore took place in the, in the late 1800s. And I kept fishing around. It was a, it was a legal case. So a woman claimed her, her dead daughter was actually murdered and her daughter's ghost was coming and telling her who the, the killer was. And weirdly, that her testimony, you know, about what her daughter told her was admitted into court and led to the conviction of the criminal of, of the actual murderer. It is the only time, as far as I know, that the testimony of a ghost, secondhand testimony of a ghost, uh, led to a conviction, you know, in a, in a real case. And it's an, actu- it's an actual real case. It's so fascinating. So I figured law, 1800s, crime, you know, what's my in there? And I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. So I started noodling around to see if, if there's any chance in the official Sherlock Holmes canon where he was in America. Weirdly, turns out he was in America around that same time, according to the stories that, that Doyle wrote. So I, I made it a Sherlock Holmes story set in West Virginia. He's traveling the country with Watson, uh, and they happen to be called down to West Virginia to deal with this case. So I wound up using a completely different element, alien to the expected topic. You know, uh, I think the, the editor expected me just to retell that story. But as I said, everyone knows the story. You don't want to wind up saying what everyone already knows. So I... I, I added an element they could not possibly have expected, and it became a very, very fun story. Um, actually, weirdly, it got me invited to the um, Baker Street Irregulars dinner in, in, at the Yale Club in New York, Black Tie Affair. I'm sitting there with Neil Gaiman the whole time, and I told him that story, and he's like, that is the weirdest way to get involved in the story. <clears throat> but it's, it's how stories start. So let's, let's take a pause. Pause real quick to talk about what actually a short story is. <clears throat> um, there are short shorts, which is the you know. Well, actually, let's start with flash fiction. Flash fiction are very short stories. They can be anywhere from fifty to a thousand words, depending on the market. I've seen some as high as fifteen hundred words, <clears throat> and they're usually more like an expanded moment within a story rather than a complete story because the word count doesn't allow you for that full arc. Um, with Weird Tales, I actually buy two pieces of flash fiction each month or each issue uh, because it's a fascinating way of telling stories. It's, it's very quick. You know, it's, it's like a punch in, in terms of, you know, bam, you have that. The next <clears throat> category up is short shorts. Short shorts, there's really no specific word count for this. It's anywhere above, you know, my guess, anywhere above 1,500 words and below 5,000 or, you know, 4,000, somewhere in that range. Very short. Most of the short story, short shorts I read have tend to be in the, the two to three range. Then you have short stories, which go up to 7,500 words. Most of us consider the, the, the floor of short stories like 4,000 up to 7,500 words. That's, that's the range for them. Um, then beyond that, you have novelette, which is 7,500 to 17,499 words. Uh, those are a lot of fun to write. And I tend to write more in the novelette zone because I like the, the additional opportunity to, to build character as well as to have more than one action set piece. I like, I like a lot of movement in the story. Um, beyond novelette, you have novella, 17,500 words to 39,999 words. And above that is novel. Anything above 40,000 is novel. Um, <clears throat> knowing what kind of story you're writing, um, whether it's going to be for a magazine, an anthology, a, a webzine, um, a contest, whatever, usually there are guidelines that, that let you know what length is your max. The, the, <clears throat> the ceiling is a funny thing. Um, if, it's a, if, it's any, if it's being edited by someone else, the, the ceiling in terms of word count is there because they have to work within a space limitation and a budget. Uh, sometimes they'll say, you know, it's, it's a, f- a thousand word uh, ceiling in terms of pay, but if you want to go a little longer, that's fine. We have room for more words, but we don't have a bigger budget. I've seen that happen quite a lot. And I've, I've also done that with some of the, the writers who write for my anthology. 
We just uh, wrapped an anthology called Aliens versus Predator, it's set in those two franchise worlds. And a couple of the writers, you know, above the word count, we just reminded them that the pay has a, has a hard, you know, cap at, at a certain level. Beyond that, you're not going to get paid. And, you know, the ones who went over were cool with that. They wanted to be able to tell their story. That's fine if, if the word, uh, the overall word limit for the manuscript allows it. Um, but most often an editor wants you to, to stay below that ceiling because they have a tightly budgeted uh, thing. And if, if it's an editor who's selling something to a, a house, and I'll explain this before I go further, um, a lot of projects, like the one I just named, um, Alien versus Predator, I co-edited it with a buddy of mine, Brian Thomas Schmidt. The publisher is Titan Books. The owner of the license, because it's a license thing, is uh, Fox and Disney. Fox, that section of Fox being bought by Disney. Um, so <clears throat> the licensor has uh, authorized a certain amount of money, a certain amount of word count, and certain restrictions. And we, you know, uh, limit uh, what we can write, what we can't write, and so on. <clears throat> and we editors have to make sure our writers stay within that. We can't have everyone write really long stories, even if they're not getting paid above a certain level because then the print cost of the book is going to skyrocket. And right now with our supply chain stuff, the last thing we want to do is, is put out longer books than, than we've budgeted for. <clears throat> Sorry for the, uh, the clear my throat a lot. Allergy season out here in Southern California is driving me crazy. So um, sometimes when you, when you sell a story to one of these markets, an anthology, uh, they may come back and ask you to shorten it um, some writers are willing to do that. Some writers don't, and they're willing to drop. And that, that's that's a tough one because if the if the editor has already posted what the ceiling is in their guidelines, you should be following the guidelines as, as best you can. Submission guidelines for those who are not as familiar with them, there are a set of parameters that the the editor has preferred that you follow or wants you to follow, or in some cases requires that you follow. So it, it might be word count. It'll certainly be subject matter. Um, if you're, if you like for Weird, Weird Tales magazine, some people have submitted stories to me at Weird Tales that are just horror, just fantasy, just science fiction. But we don't publish those because it's Weird Tales. We want those with a weirder twist on it. Like if you're familiar with, with science fiction movies, there is a movie <clears throat> called Event Horizon, which was a, a pretty gritty horror film. That's weird because it's supernatural elements along with the science fiction. Um, Alien, which is not supernatural, still is weird because you have this race of almost indestructible insects. And it's, it's told as horror stories, but it's science fiction. That would be weird tales. Star Wars would not be. Um, so you have, to know, you have to know the market in order to understand what the, what the editor's requirement is in terms of, of how to hit the genre, what we're buying and what we're not. Um, you also, um, we also talk about format. Uh, anything that's submitted to me has to be in Times New Roman, 12 point font, double space, no extra spaces between paragraphs, five to seven space indent in the first, uh, in each paragraph. That's what I use. That's the industry standard anyway, in the, in the traditional publishing industry. And I don't want to have to reformat anyone because my master document is going to be in that. I don't want to have to reformat everyone's work to fit into my master document. So if I get a submission that it, where it's not in that format, I don't read the submission. I reject it like that. I don't care if it's from a top writer. I'm going to write back and say it doesn't, doesn't fit the guidelines. Um, you know, well, basically that doesn't fit our guidelines. Uh, if, if it's somebody, if it's a friend, I might say perhaps reread the guidelines and try again. Um, but th that's what, you know, that's what the editor wants. That's the doorway into selling to the editor. Now, if you're, if you're doing your own publishing, you know, there's a lot of utilities for publishing short stories. The format, you know, is your decision. You're, you're the editor of that. So you choose what you want. Uh, I have, but let's, let's shift over a little bit to talk about content and opportunity. There are things in, in the, um, the book world that you can do in short form that are harder to, to get away with in novel form. I, I like, I go to a lot of conventions. You mm -hmm. see a Can you go back and say those again? Yes. What's that? Can you go back and say those again uh, on our side? 
it got paused and we missed a lot of that good stuff. Can you go back? What again? The content and opportunity. How to uh, expand your own creativity. So let's, we'll pick it up from there. It'll, it'll probably fold into what I was just saying a second ago. Um, in larger format, you can't take as many risks. And I, I was talking about steampunk. I like steampunk, but it is hard to sell a steampunk novel why that is, but it's the truth. I had a friend, Dexter Palmer, who did this brilliant, brilliant novel um, called The Dream of Perpetual Motion. It's brilliant. Despite the fact that it got starred reviews, the audience of in steampunk apparently don't read novels as much. They do read short stories, though, short stories and a number of different times. I did do one steampunk novel, but it was tied to, it was in part of what's called media tie-in writing, where you're writing inside someone else's established license. In that case, it was the Deadlands role-playing game, which is similar to Conan McGuire and Jeffrey Marriott. They, we, we each did one novel in that series. And those books were successful, but it was successful because it was tied to a board game, not because, it, and it wasn't marketed to steampunk, by the way. Um, there, you know, publishers are afraid of that word, except in the short form. Um, in short form, I love taking all kinds of creative risks. Here's an example of one. Uh, you guys know who Max Brooks is? World War Z guy, son of Mel Brooks, right? So, mostly set in... In World War II or the Korean War, some Vietnam War stuff. When my son was a kid, G.I. Joe was this little science fiction action figure with all sorts of, um, you know, gadgets and, and, and weird, uh, read a uh, novella, or not novelette rather, for that anthology. I had never seen those figures other than in toy stores. So I went up, the publisher gave me DVD for a license that I had no, no uh, familiarity with. Opportunity is there and there's some money attached to it. It's worth taking the time to do a little bit of homework. Um, most of, of the folks I know who have gone from indie writers to traditional writers, anthology of Sherlock Holmes stories, for example, somebody's doing a, an anthology and they, they go and kind of show their chops to short story writers and then that's a good way of using that as a calling card to a publisher to say, hey, I would like to, to write a novel for pay. You know, uh, my friend, a couple of friends of mine broke in by writing short stories in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer world and launched hugely successful careers. It happens. Um, one of my early, one, uh, early um, projects was, was I had met Charlene Harris at a, uh, at a convention. And, you know, conventions are great for talking to people people of all levels, all aspects of the business. She liked, she had seen me on a panel, liked what I had to say, hadn't yet read any of my books and reached out and asked me if I would like to write a, a True Blood short story for an anthology they were putting together. It's like, of, of course. I had not watched a single episode of True Blood. I had to read several of the books and I marathoned through a whole bunch of True Blood episodes, got up to speed, picked the character I wanted to use, wrote the story and she loved it. So there's homework involved in this. The one of the big advantages it offers for you to grow as a writer, to, to get out of your comfort zone, and I hate being locked in a, in a, in a, in a box as a writer. Uh, when I was a kid, Ray Bradbury and Richard Matheson both advised me to never let myself be pigeonholed, ever. And if you know who Ray, Richard Matheson is, he wrote I Am Legend, um, What Dreams May Come, Somewhere in Time, uh, Star of Echoes, I mean... He's written all over the place, mystery, science fiction, fantasy, horror, thrillers. Uh, no two of his books ever seem to fit in the, on the same shelf. Launching his career right now, he'd be going in through the indie door because um, now publishers try to fit you more into a box, writing what you want. But when you're doing these short stories, it's, it, you don't want to have somebody say, hey, here's an opportunity. It dries up the number of opportunities that come your way, for one thing. It also, you're self-limiting because you have no proof you can't do that. Just be to find the voice of that story. I've done so many, the best one. Maybe I should try another character. Maybe I should sh shift from third to first ways to practice different kinds of storytelling. 
and trying them with different types of genres. As a result, you, you, you kind of burn out that Okay, so opportunities for writers come in a lot of different forms. And one of the best things you can do is look for ways that stretch you as a writer. I, I don't know if you caught all that, but that's, the, that's where I'm getting to with, with that one part of it. There are different ways to find markets. Um, you can go to raylan.com, R-A-L-A-N.com. Uh, you can go to duotrope, D-U-O-T-R-O-P-E.com. That's a pay site. Raylan is free. Uh, or you can you can go to the basically to Google or whatever your search engine is, put in your genre and subgenre. Like for example, steampunk. Um, you can put in um, submission guidelines or just guidelines, and set your search so that it's a recent search, six months, nine months, uh, and you can tailor that with your search engine uh, because you don't want to find essentially dead gui- uh, or expired guidelines. Look for those guidelines. Whether you plan to submit to the magazine or not, if you're learning the short story form, it's sometimes it's worth writing the short story <clears throat> as if you're going to submit so that you can then uh, get the practice of expanding your creative range. I did that a lot. Another uh, uh, tool that's really useful for this, and I mentioned it in one of the other classes, so some of you may have heard this before, is I always created these um, prompts, list of prompts. I'd make long lists of all different types of story prompts. Uh, first page of a short story uh, dealing with uh, two runaway kids. First, first um, uh, love scene between um, two people who met after 30 years apart. Um, a science fiction uh, short story opening about a spaceship landing in uh, Central Park. You know, whatever it's going to be. Uh, different genres, different age groups, and so on. And I, spent, I used to spend 15 minutes minutes, the beginning of every writing day, 15 minutes, just writing in that one prompt. And then I would take another one. And I would make sure that none of the prompts I had were the zones that I felt were my comfort zones. I wanted to make sure that I was always pushing myself beyond. I put poetry in there. I did romance and all sorts of stuff, just so that I could always say that, yes, I can put at least, at very least, a workmanlike job on that. But ideally, I want to, you know, I was looking for genres that I found surprisingly exciting um, opportunities that like, wow, this, this is, this is really cool. Maybe I should do more of this. Um, that helped me take a lot of jobs or, or reach out to a lot of markets that I would not otherwise have done because of the natural timidity people have when they know their safe zone and that's where they want, they're afraid to go outside of it. And like most, most writers, we are moody people. Um, we, we sometimes are hesitant about trying things that are outside of our zone. It kind of kicks in the imposter syndrome, kicks in the doubt because can we actually bring game to that, et cetera, et cetera. Trying those different markets, trying those different genre types and subgenre types really helps. If you go to my website, by the way, jonathanmayberry.com, spell my last name right, it's M-A-B-E-R-R-Y, jonathanmayberry.com. On that page, on that website is a page called Free Stuff for writers. Some cool stuff there. But if you go down to the bottom, there's a list of, I think, four or five or maybe six PDFs that are clickable, downloadable um, of subgenres. So romance subgenres, science fiction subgenres, and so on. Go look for those and see maybe, maybe you may not think of yourself as a science fiction writer until you start going down and you say, oh, I didn't realize that was really science fiction or that center. So let me try that. It's worth trying to constantly build what you can do. Another really important reason to expand your your creative abilities beyond your comfort zone is actually two things. One, you never know when a genre is going to go completely cold. And if you're stuck in one lane and that lane is, you know, gridlocked, you got you're not making making sales. You're not, you know, you're not selling books or short stories. The other thing there is um, the other advantage of doing this sort of thing is. It, you, you can create works that don't compete with one another, um, which really influences more of your novel life. But if you practice the diversity within your short stories, if novels, like, like right now, I write four novels a year. I write, uh, I'm writing an epic fantasy. I write thrillers. I, I write science fiction. I write horror and a few other things. So, but this year, th- those four genres are what I'm writing novels in. Those novels are in different publishers and they're not competing with one another. And even 
if I write two novels for the same publisher, but they're in different categories, and my thriller and my, my epic fantasy are both with St. Martin's Griffin, those books can come out close to each other without competing because they're different markets. There'll be some overlap, but they're mostly different markets. That allows me to increase my work product, increase the number of income streams I have, and make more money, which is great. Uh, also, uh, audio short stories. Audible um, is actually paying writers to write original short stories. I, I helped uh, them prove that as a successful model some years ago with a story I did called Lullaby, which was given free to people. Um, it, it, the success of that led to what the creation of what's called the Audible Plus catalog, where you know if you subscribe to it, you get lots of free content. The writers of that free content still get paid. I have a novelette that went up two weeks ago uh, a social media satire about a slacker who outs himself as a werewolf on YouTube. They paid me for that. It went up on, on, on uh, YouTube as a gift to anyone who subscribed to the Plus catalog. But the writer gets paid. Um, that's the sort of thing we really, really love to happen when we can increase the number of income streams we have. And you can also self-publish short stories and put them up on different platforms and have those as separate income streams coming your way. Now, I know we're short on time and there's a hard out at nine. So if you guys have any questions, please ask them now. I can't see you. So I'm just going to wait until I hear a voice asking me a question. So hopefully we have, we have something out, out there for me to answer. It's the suspense now. And if we don't have any questions, somebody should tell me that so I can keep talking about the topic. Right. Apparently, we're not doing the question part. So with these markets, now, uh, let's, let's go to magazine markets for the last few minutes. I love magazine uh, markets. I love magazine short fiction. Um, oh, we do have a question? We were wondering if you had notes that might be able to be shared with us because it's been so glitchy. We we're wondering if... I usually don't do notes, but I will, const I will create a set of notes for this. And um, I'm trying to think the best way for you guys to get it. The easiest way would, would be give me about a day or two. And then either e email me at Jonathan underscore Mayberry at yahoo.com. Or did you have another suggestion for that? Uh, definitely that we are looking forward to those notes. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll create those notes. I'm sorry that the, the live stream isn't working as well. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I love seeing people get into the short story market. It's such a, a, a lucrative thing. It's growing as a market. Um, anthologies are coming back after after falling off for a while. Print magazines are coming back. The one thing about um, magazines to know, though, there's often a window for submissions. So with Weird Tales, for example, you know we started slow. We you know it took us a couple a little while to get the financial backing to bring the magazine back in full. Starting next year, we'll be doing three issues a year. Um, with that. Some of it's going to be curated by me as the editor, and some of it's going to be open call. Some magazines, mine included, for open call, we will be asking for short story pitches, one to three paragraph short story pitches first. The reason we're doing this is uh, because Weird Tales has a certain specific vibe to it, we don't want you know, stories that are going to replicate things. A lot of people like doing stories with an HP Lovecraft vibe. We get a lot of them. We don't want so many that that's, that's the only thing we're getting. So the pitches will, will help us pick and choose the stories that, we, that sound the most interesting, and then they get submitted to us. And then from those, we'll pick the ones that actually will be in the magazine. Some magazines and some anthologies, it's completely open, open call. Some magazines and anthologies also limit the call to who can pitch. For I did an anthology recently called uh, Don't Turn Out the Lights, which was uh, a tribute to scary stories to tell in the dark. I curated most of it and I had four slots open and we opened it up to members of the Horror Writers Association because it was their anthology they were doing. People outside the Horror Writers couldn't submit to it. I've been in Mystery Writer Magazine, Mystery Writer uh, Association anthologies where, again, it's limited to that membership. So that's a thing. And I'll be doing a new anthology coming up soon for media tie-in writing, but you have you have to actually be a media tie-in writer. Um, I have a question. Oh, you do have a question. Good, hit me. Okay, so I am putting together an anthology of my own short stories. What cool. kind of cover should I be looking at 
to go with my anthology? Okay, first off, if it's all your short stories, it's a collection. Anthology is multiple authors. So just a little thing. Uh, what's your genre? Um, it's a uh, murder. Okay. Detective series, murder mystery kind of stuff. Uh, murder, uh, well, m- crime novels of various kinds tend to have a graphic cover, not a not a photo cover. So it, it you know, if you look at the most of uh, the best selling books in that zone, and they can be traditionally published. Look at the cover design style because readers tend to expect, it's weird, but readers expect to be able to judge a book by its cover. You know, if it looks like a thriller or a mystery, they, they, you know, they feel a little more confident that it is in fact that. And uh, I've noticed uh, with friends of mine who publish uh, indie uh, uh, novels and short fiction, a lot of the most successful ones tend to go for covers that look like the same artistic and thematic of uh, zone as the tradi- successful traditional books. So build your list of, of authors whose uh, readers would probably be your readers and go look at their covers and you'll, you'll be able to get a sense of it. I do recommend paying a little extra to get a good uh, cover design because you know we do actually judge books by their cover. If it looks professional, whether it's indie or not, it looks professional, then it, it's more appealing. I have a friend, Indy Quillen, self-published um, uh, mystery novelist. You, there's no way to tell from interior or, or cover that her books are indie because they are so professionally done. And there are so many professionals working freelance now that are working with the indie crowd. Those who are, who are paying a little extra to get a really great cover are the ones who are likely going to attract more readers because browsing a good cover catches the eye. And we want that effect. Any other questions? It's kind of weird not being able to see you guys. It's like you've all entered the spirit realm. The ghost convention. Okay, so a couple of things to kind of close us out here. Um, as I've said with my other classes, if you guys have questions, and you know, I will create the, the notes for this, but if you have other questions that we weren't able to handle or you couldn't hear because of, of uh, the interruptions, I invite you to be able to message me. <clears throat> message me. You can email me, Jonathan underscore Mayberry at yahoo.com. Again, spell the last name right. You can message me through uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you know, it, it, when in doubt in the emails, put, you know, question from 20K to 50 books, just so I know the context of who you are and where you're writing from. Um, but I, writers want other writers in the game, traditional, non-traditional, um, hybrid, whatever. We want more writers in the game because that draws more readers overall to books. So if I can help you move forward by answering a couple of questions, keeping you from a time-wasting mistake, I'm more than happy to do that. So please take the time to send me a message. A few people have from the last couple of days, and that's great. Um, I'll also be doing another class this afternoon, hopefully, if the Wi-Fi is good at noon, on um, uh doing research for your stories. And it's, it's, it's as effective for novels as it is for, um, for short stories because there's a nonfiction basis to a lot of uh, fiction. And we'll be talking about that research and that'll be in a, in a couple of hours. Sorry that the, uh, the, the tech thing's gotten in the way of this because it's more fun <laughs> when you guys can sit there and actually hear what I'm saying and I can see you. It's a little, little disconcerting to, to just look, be seeing my own face. I see that enough. Um, any last question or two? We have still have two minutes. And again, if, if there aren't any, somebody should tell me that so I'm not, I don't sit here just kind of staring blankly at the screen. Nope. Okay. Uh, no last questions, but we're... Oh, there is a question. Thank Jesus. <laughs> no last questions, but... We're... Oh, no last questions. Rats. Okay. So no last questions. Um, I don't know whether that is because... I have managed to tell you everything you need to know about short stories, which I doubt in 45 minutes, or because this is broken up so much, it's interfered with that. Whatever reason, if you have questions, please get them to me by whatever uh, means at any point, and I will get those notes prepared. And you can email me or message me for the notes. Give me until Sunday. Um, Saturday's my wife's birthday, so I'll be working on it tomorrow and then probably have them available by Sunday. 
Okay, folks, I hope the rest of your conference um, is, is either live or with better video. And uh, I'll talk to you all soon.